Um, I'm Scott Burns. I'm the Senior Director of Research and Development at Packet. Um, before I tell you what Packet is, I just wanted to welcome everybody to the Open Source Firmware Conference. I think this is a great place for everybody to collaborate on open source firmware, and I hope we continue doing this every year. So um, I work for Packet. Packet is a bare metal cloud company. So instead of uh, what I'll call a traditional cloud, where you get a virtual machine, um, we give out full servers. So the minimum unit you get uh, instead of a virtual machine, which you might be sharing, uh, you might have you know tons of virtual machines with other customers on a server. Well, we give you the entire server. Um, now that doesn't mean that um, it has to be a you know dual socket server with terabyte of RAM. You, you can start small. We have small servers with just uh, quad core Atom processors and a couple gigs of RAM and we go all the way up. So you can start small even though you have a full server. Um, yeah, different sizes are available um, to fit your workload. Um, and so unlike um, most cloud computing providers, um, we give you full access to the server. There is no hypervisor involved at all. Um, you have direct access. So you get install your operating system directly on the server. Um, and you have full control once we hand it over to you. Uh, you are welcome to bring your own virtualization if you like. You can run ESXi. You can run uh, KVM, uh, you can run Zen, run any virtualization you want on top. Or you can just run your workload directly on the bare metal. Uh, it's up to you. That's part of the reason I actually got involved with Packet, because um, I thought it kind of democratizes the cloud world. Um, you're not getting locked into using um, you know, a proprietary stack uh, with a particular provider. We give you a server, and you do what you like with it, basically. So uh, that was part of the reason that I got involved with Packet to begin with. Um, and we also support a lot of um, open source foundations like the Linux Foundation and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, just some of many. Uh, we, we really like to engage with the open source community and uh, give back when we can. Um, actually, before I continue, I guess I should introduce myself a little bit. So I've, I've been in the web hosting industry for about 20 years almost now. Um, so. I've been involved long before uh, BMCs were a thing in servers. You know, nowadays you kind of expect the server to come with a BMC in it so you can control the power and uh, connect your virtual media and have your uh, you know, virtual console and all that. Um, back when I started using servers, um, that was just starting to become a thing. You could add a BMC add-on card and at that time um, gave you the ability to turn the server on and off, uh, give you a serial console. And if you were lucky, you might have had access to some sensors. But uh, nothing like today, where you have uh, virtual media and uh, any other, all these other features that we have uh, on a modern BMC. Um, all right, so well, I've been spending, oh, about four months now uh, focusing mainly on using open source firmware uh, on packet servers. So, you know, at the moment we use whatever BIOS the vendor supplies, we use whatever BMC firmware comes with the server, but um, really want to change that. Um, anybody who's dealt with BMCs uh, much knows um, the quality is missing, uh, to put it lightly. Um, there, there have been problems with BMC firmware where you know we've reported it, and it takes months just to get an acknowledgement that uh, you know a ticket's been opened to even look at it. And uh, if, if we're lucky, maybe a year and a half later, two years later, the bug gets fixed. So um, you know, part part of that has to do with um, there's so many parties involved with writing BMC firmware. You know, the the actual server vendor usually isn't doing it themselves. They're usually uh, outsourcing it to another company, which is using an SDK from another company, which is uh, then, uh, you know, write, writing uh, the libraries to run on a, another vendor's BMC. And there's, there's just multiple players involved. And anytime you report a problem, nobody wants to take responsibility for it. 
So, you know, enough of that. We want to just get in there and be able to fix problems ourselves. So uh, BMC is obviously an important part of um, a bare metal cloud. We, we need the ability to uh, control the server um, without having any sort of agent installed on the host operating system because in the bare metal cloud case, uh, the, the customer has full, full control of the host system uh, once we hand it over to them. So uh, any value added features that we're going to have, we, we need to have in the BMC. And that's why we really need control of the firmware running on the BMC. So um, I work in the research and development part of Packet. So I'm in a small group called Packet Labs. And um, one of the things we do is we try to keep our options open. So you know, I've, I've listed a number of different uh, firmware projects here. And you know, we're looking at all these at the same time. We don't want to pick a winner just yet. So uh, on the BMC side, you know, open BMC is kind of an obvious choice to go with. But uh, UBMC is also doing some interesting things. And uh, so uh, taking a look at both at the same time. And then uh, on the BIOS side, of course, you have Core Boot, Tiano Core, Linux Boot. CBIOS and uh, for um, for ARM servers, you also have the trustedfirmware.org. Uh, I'll go into more details on these uh, later slides. So uh, on the BMC side, um, you have OpenBMC and you have UBMC uh, for the most part. Um, if anybody is working on any um, open source BMC projects besides those, I'd love to hear about them. Those are obviously the two obvious mm -hmm. choices right now. Um, so OpenBMC um, originally started by Facebook. They released it publicly in 2015, um, but they were prototyping it in 2014 for um, the wedge switch that they were designing at the time. Um, when people think of OpenBMC, that's usually uh, the version they're thinking about from Facebook. But around the same time, IBM also released BMC firmware um, with the same name, which kind of made things a little confusing. So uh, IBM was uh, collaborating with Rackspace on an open power server. And um, you know, I, th I think they had some communication with Facebook when they did this, but uh, they basically released their own open BMC, which uh, is still based on Yocto, uh, Linux, and uh, it, you know, it had a very similar build process, but very different code base, very different community. And so for a few years, there was a really confusing situation when you talk about OpenBMC. You don't know if somebody's talking about Facebook OpenBMC or IBM OpenBMC. Um, luckily, uh, it's not an issue anymore. So uh, basically, Facebook and IBM got together, a few more companies, also uh, IBM and Intel and Microsoft. And they kind of all agreed to put their resources behind one code base. So uh, OpenBMC is now a Linux Foundation project. project. Um, and uh, you, you don't have to worry about competing um, communities anymore. So, uh, but OpenBMC is not the only choice out there. We also have uh, UBMC. It was released um, last year, 2018. And uh, it's mainly based on the Go language. Uh, you know, there's still some C code in the bootloader. But uh, once once uh, once you've booted your kernel, you're using a user land that's basically completely uh, made out of Go. Um, it's built on uroot, and um, they, they they change uh, trying to change the status quo. So instead of uh, IPMI, they're using gRPC um, as a kind of a method of interacting with the BMC. Um, but like I said, don't want to pick winners yet. I, th I think some of the things UBMC is doing is interesting. Uh, one of the nice things about it is it's, it's simpler to work with. So OpenBMC has a complex code base, and it, ugh, there's a steep learning curve to figure out um, if, if you want to make any changes to OpenBMC, you really need to spend some time with it first. You can just jump in there. Whereas UBMC, simple code, um, you, you can probably find uh, the code you want to change within a few minutes if you just look around. So uh, I've been spending time hacking on UBMC. Uh, 
for certain projects just because it's just so much easier to just jump in there and get going. Um, so first problem is, okay, fine. Um, you've built a BMC image, whether that's with OpenBMC or UBMC or something else. How do you get it onto a server um, that has already come with proprietary firmware? So uh, it seems like it should be an easy thing, but it's not. If you have physical access to the server, um, okay, uh, you know you can hook up a SOIC clip. Uh, and this example on, on the slide, I used a Raspberry Pi um, connected to the clip, and the clip goes over the uh, SPI flash chip, and uh, you can read and write directly to the flash that way. Um, you know, this, the motherboard is not on. Uh, you need to provide some power to the flash chip, but um, you know you're, by, you're bypassing any software protections or anything else that uh, the vendor might try to throw in your way to stop you from up, updating the firmware. So um, it's kind of a last resort way uh, to change the firmware on a server, but it doesn't scale if you want to do this to. Uh, you know, you say you have racks full of servers, you're not going to pull them all out and hook up a clip to each one and put it back in the server, uh, put it back in the rack. That's just not going to scale at all. So uh, another method you can use to, at least in the case of A-speed BMCs, um, they distribute a utility called SOC Flash. Uh, you run it on the host system. It actually bypasses the software stack that's running on the BMC. There's no kernel involvement or anything like that. Um, the thing with that is uh, that was recently uh, a lot of a lot of BMC vendors didn't realize that that feature was turned on in their BMC firmware. So um, an ex uh, you might have heard of uh, an exploit called uh, Pants Down, which is an interesting name for an exploit. I don't know where they came up with that name, but uh, that's actually just the name they use to describe a way of completely bypassing the BMC firmware and. Uh, Flashing whatever you want to the BMC's flash, uh, you can access the uh, and actually actually access the memory on the SOC and change it and uh, do whatever you want. Um, it's kind of it's a hardware feature that's built into the ASP BMCs, but um, it can be disabled uh, when the BMC boots. So uh, you know a lot of server vendors have started putting out new firmware that uh, disables uh, that feature um, when the BMC first boots. And uh, fortunately, if you wanted to use SOC Flash to uh, change the firmware, a lot of cases you can no longer do that. Um, but in the, in the case of a uh, bare metal cloud like Packet, uh, that wasn't an ideal way of updating it anyway, because we have a lot of servers that are already in use by customers. So we can't really just reboot their server and and uh, run this uh, SOC flash utility if we want to uh, do an upgrade um, you know, without having a maintenance window and all that. So that's a pain. So kept looking for better ways to do this. So um, the, way, uh, the way I settled on uh, while I was working on this is to reverse engineer the uh, proprietary firmware images that the vendors provide. So uh, you know, when you buy a server, uh, your vendor probably provides BMC firmware updates once in a while, and they give you an image file you can download, and you can upload it through um, you know, the web interface, or maybe uh, give you an uh, IPMI tool command you can run to do it. But uh, those images are in a proprietary format. And so at the moment, you can't just uh, have something like OpenBMC create a firmware image in that format that you can uh, you can upload through the proprietary interface that your uh, server came with. So uh, the good news is those, those special firmware formats are fairly easy to reverse engineer. And uh, of course I did that. Um, so since the firmware format is easy to reverse engineer, it's also possible to then go in and modify that firmware. Um, so you know you take your server vendor's firmware and you make your changes, and then you just go ahead and upload it through their normal update method. Let's let's just say it's the web interface that they provide. It's a very easy way to do it. Uh, and if you can modify your server vendor's BMC firmware, uh, 
uh, then you can also root it and you can use it for raw flash access. And at that point, you can then uh, write any firmware image you want, whether it's OpenBMC or otherwise. Um, so one of the reasons you can't just go and download like OpenBMC images right now and uh, install them on any server you want is because every server, even if it uses uh, the same you know, BMC chip, um, each, each server uh, connects to them in different ways. Uh, you have your, your sensors are connected in different places and, uh, and whatnot. So uh, in order to port something any sort of open source BMC firmware to a new server model. You need the device tree and you need the sensor list. And uh, you know, if we want to accelerate the rate of porting open source BMC firmware to new server models, then there needs to be an easier way so you don't have to manually come up with that yourself every time you want to add support to a new server. So um, there's another reason that I was focusing on reverse engineering the vendor's firmware images because uh, you can actually go in there and you can extract the device tree and you can extract the sensor list and you can, you can turn the job of porting um, your open source firmware to that new server model. Uh, you know, it just becomes a lot easier. You might need to do a handful of uh, handful of uh, manual changes, but for the most part, um, this can be automated. Uh, so really uh, speeds up the rate of uh, porting uh, your BMC firmware. Uh, excuse me. Um, anyway, so I'll move on to open source BIOS. So I already went over this list earlier on. I'm going to skip over to the details for each uh, one here. So. Core boot is pretty well known. Um, it, core boot just basically does the initial hardware initialization. So uh, it initializes your memory controller, it does early initialization of your chipset, but uh, that's really all it's meant to do. Uh, it gives you a serial console, but it gets out of your way. And so if you want to uh, do anything more advanced, uh, you would load a payload on top, but uh, you know, I, I think the simplicity of core boot is one of its greatest features. So um, you have a lot of flexibility with what you can do once you have that uh, basic initialization out of the way. Uh, Tiano core, um, anybody who's familiar with that knows it's a fairly complex uh, package, uh, not very easy to work with, um, but you can use it as core boot payload if you wanna provide a UEFI environment uh, boot with. Um, Linux boot is interesting because uh, you can bypass Tiano Core and uh, Linux boot provides a partial UFI implementation on top of the Linux kernel right now. Obviously, uh, I would expect that to continue to expand and become a fuller UEFI implementation, but uh, it's, it's interesting to look at because it's not Tiano Core and not, nothing wrong with Tiano Core, but it's always good to have alternatives and sometimes uh, you want to have something simpler to work with when you're prototyping something new. So uh, Linux boot also works as a core boot payload. Um, CBIOS, uh, it's for legacy x86. Um, if, you've, uh, you know, if you've booted up a virtual machine on, so let's say, QMU or something, you've probably seen CBIOS. Uh, it works as a BIOS for virtual machines, or it works as uh, BIOS for physical machines, uh, certain cases. So uh, in the case of core boot, uh, you, you can load CBIOS and uh, do a legacy x86 boot. And then uh, if you're running uh, an ARM server, um, ARM recently contributed um, a reference implementation for, uh, for booting into the, an ARM secure world. Uh, it's currently maintained by Linero and uh, can also be integrated with Core Boot. So uh, you probably noticed that every one of those I mentioned Core Boot, because uh, the one of the one of the great things about Core Boot is that you can you can you can start with Core Boot, you can do your early initialization, and then you can go different ways depending on what you need to do. So uh, 
you could load different payloads on demand. If you need to load a legacy x86 operating system, you go in the CBIOS. If you uh, if you just want to boot Linux, uh, you could do that directly from core boot, or uh, maybe you want to be able to still provide some UEFI runtime services, so you could uh, load a Tiano core or Linux boot uh, payload and run on top of that. Um, but you, you can also, if you're using open source uh, BMC firmware along with your open source BIOS, you can have the BIOS coordinate with the BMC and basically select which payload uh, to load on demand. So uh, in, the, in the case of a bare metal cloud, um, you might have a certain customer that wants to provision the server and uh, they're running an old operating system image. Uh, and so that they want to do a legacy boot. Um, so just uh, signal to the BMC that you want to do a legacy boot and it'll uh, work with core boot and have core boot go directly into CBIOS, for example. And um, it makes for very fast boots uh, because you don't have to load a bunch of unnecessary payloads uh, or have them ready to go. You're just going in directly into the payload that you want. Um, so there are a lot of benefits of uh, running an open source BIOS and a, on bare metal um, compared to just taking whatever proprietary uh, I'll, I'll be polite. I won't use any terrible words to describe what, uh, what most vendors will give you. But um, let's just say you, you can have better quality, better security, uh, better everything if uh, you have uh, access to the source code and you can compile your own BIOS. So you can, you can do things like uh, check your option ROMs or your UEFI drivers. Uh, you can check the uh, you can check uh, the cryptographic hash before loading any of those things. So maybe you have a list of pre-approved devices where you actually want to be able to run their option ROMs and uh, everything else you can ignore. Um, obviously, if you're starting with uh, core boot, it's uh, fast. You can boot in seconds instead of minutes or in some servers that I've worked with, uh, it would take five, six, seven minutes to boot, which not really sure what's going on under the hood, but if you can control what's going on under the hood, then get that down to seconds. Um, you can add um, custom system management interrupt handlers. So uh, Eugene, that was interesting that you were talking about the system management uh, mode and system management interrupts before. Um, there are a lot of possibilities um, if you're able to install your own uh, system management interrupt handlers. Um, obviously, if you're using a proprietary BIOS, you, you can't do that. Uh, you, you get whatever your BIOS vendor provides you, and by the time you're booting into your operating system, you no longer have the ability to add new system management handlers. Um, but if you control the BIOS, then you can. Um, and of course, uh, if you're using open source BMC firmware, you can integrate, um, you have uh, features that integrate between both of them. So you can have your BMC communicating with your BIOS uh, during the boot process. And it gives you a lot of, uh, opens up a lot of new features that uh, aren't currently available. So uh, basically any, anything you can think of, you can do as long as you have open source BIOS. Um, so system management mode um, on x86, it's uh, considered ring negative two, which is uh, higher privilege than the hypervisor, which of course is higher privilege than the operating system. Um, so like I was just saying, since the operating system or hypervisor uh, isn't able to install uh, system management interrupt handlers, then uh, there's something you can do in the BIOS. You, you can use this for security monitoring features, obviously, because um, whatever OS is running on the server can no longer uh, interfere with those handlers in theory if it's implemented properly using modern hardware. Um, so system management mode was originally used for power management, but uh, be used for security features. And uh, so one of those features would be uh, to uh, detect any attempts on a server to write to flash. So if somebody tries to uh, 
replace your BIOS with their own. Uh, remember, I'm talking about a bare metal cloud here where customers have direct access to a server. Uh, so that's one case where we need to prevent that from happening. So um, system management mode, you can uh, basically configure the chipset to generate a system management interrupt anytime the flash is accessed. Um, and you can then uh, basically signal the BMC at that point and have the BMC send out a real-time alert. So in the case of uh, bare metal cloud, um, you know, we're not really looking for um, cases where customers are trying to uh, modify a flash. We're really looking for uh, cases where uh, the server has been exploited and, you know, you might have a botnet perhaps trying to uh, add a rootkit to the BIOS, so things like that. So um, obviously, if you're using an open source BMC and an open source BIOS, then you can create a feature where you have a real time alert anytime that tries, anytime that happens. Um, so we, we've talked about open source uh, firmware, but what about open hardware? So um, obviously, with the Open Compute Project, there have been a lot of companies contributing hardware designs. Um, there are uh, you know, additional security features you could add if you uh, have more hardware. So uh, what I'm thinking of here is having a security controller uh, in a server. And uh, you could use it to protect uh, firmware for basically anything in this, uh, in a server that uses firmware, whether it's a CPU, a BMC, the network controller. Um, basically, uh, verify firmware before it actually returns it back to those devices. So you can hold the system and reset uh, while you're verifying um, you know, parts of your firmware. And then uh, you can provide multiple SPI uh, buses for each, so that you, you know, each device has its own virtual flash chip, basically. Uh, even though you only need to physically have one flash chip, um, you, you can add other features like compression, since a lot of time firmware images uh, uh, waste space, they'll have a lot of um, empty space in them. Uh, and so uh, you can either save a little money or you could uh, improve performance a little bit by actually compressing those flash images. Uh, and so if, if you have some sort of security controller that is uh, in between your microcontrollers and your flash chip, then uh, you, know, you can add a feature like compression. Um, Microsoft has their Project Cerberus, which is uh, basically a controller that uh, monitors uh, flash accesses. So um, this is something that they um, are in the process of contributing to the OCP project. So um, obviously, uh, this, you know, the features on this list could be uh, built on top of something like Project Cerberus. But for now, uh, Packet is prototyping uh, uh, kind of a greenfield design using a small non-volatile FPGA. So uh, but just to make a proof of concept, but you know, after, after that, we could go back and talk to the folks at Microsoft and see if uh, we can use their chip as is or uh, maybe uh, add additional features to it. Um, so, uh, you know, most of the topics here at the conference or around either BMCs or BIOS. Uh, but there are other kinds of firmware, like uh, SmartNIC firmware. Um, so there are a number of SmartNICs coming out these days, uh, such as uh, Mel Melanox has their Bluefield uh, SmartNIC. And you know, it's basically just a network controller with that has a built-in uh, ARM processor on it. And so um, you can basically run an embedded Linux and uh, control um, the firmware running on your smart NICs. So um, uh, that's one uh, you know, one additional area that I hope to see more of at, uh, at the conference is uh, people working on things like smart NIC firmware. Um, if, if people are going to be working on open source firmware, we need to make it easier for firmware developers to have access to hardware. So uh, 
Packet being in the business of giving people access to hardware, that is something we're working on. We're not ready to uh, announce anything just yet, but uh, know that we're working on it and hopefully we'll be able to uh, make it a little easier for folks to have access to hardware uh, to actually develop on. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's, it's great that everybody here is independently uh, working on open source firmware and bypassing, um, you know, the vendors that traditionally make all that proprietary firmware that we want to get rid of, but it would be nice to have them on board. And it would be nice to have more server vendors um, doing things like contributing the open BMC, for example. So um, that is something that we're, we've also been working on at Packet. Uh, we have a couple of vendors that we are actively talking to and uh, helping them get open BMC running on their hardware and uh, getting them uh, start contributing back. So um, just want to thank a few of my Packet colleagues, uh, Manny Mendez. Uh, he kept, he's been sending me links to UBMC for months, and uh, I, I wasn't initially paying attention to it because I was focused on, on OpenBMC. But um, I, I'm glad he kept pestering me because uh, now that I've seen UBMC, I will actually like it quite a lot. Um, and he, he also reminded me that the open source firmware conference would be coming up. And so uh, if it weren't for him, I probably would not have uh, responded for the call proposals, and I probably would not be here right now. Um, Carl Perry, um, he's been attending a lot of ARM meetings for me and filling me in on what's going on. So th things like the uh, uh, trustedfirmware.org. Um, we actually work out a lot on ARM servers at Packet. And uh, so hopefully we'll be um, more active in the uh, ARM security world, uh, in their platform security architecture and things like that in the future. So uh, Carl's been very helpful with that. And then Mai Trong, uh, he's actually here at the conference. Uh, oh, he's here in the room. You want to raise your hand, Mai? So uh, Mai uh, joined Packet um, fairly recently, and I was glad when he came that uh, he shared my enthusiasm for open source firmware. So Mai has been going out there and uh, trying to get some of our collaboration going. Uh, so we, we actually have some projects going with uh, a couple other uh, Bay Area companies uh, that we're all working on together. And uh, if it weren't for my, um, yeah, we would probably just be doing these things ourselves and uh, duplicating work that other people are doing. So uh, as a team, we can actually work together and get more done. So uh, anyway, my will be around at the conference uh, all week, right? So uh, anyway, um, anybody have any questions? Have you given any thought about how the interaction between the uh, BIOS and the BMC might look like? In uh, current systems, uh, I think IPMI is the most used and not the form that we usually see it, but in uh, IPMB or something like that. But have you thought about how, um, uh, yeah, how, how that interface would look like? So basically the interface for, say, um, the BIOS booting on the CPU to actually communicate with the BMC? Uh, well, m maybe, for example, how to select <laughs> which port the boot source. You're talking about selecting like a legacy boot or something like that, yeah, if I understood it correctly. Right. So um, there are a couple of different ways of doing that. Um, but you know, the, the BMC um, actually is accessible through PCI Express, and uh, there are multiple um, I squared C buses available and uh, things like that. So, um, you know, the sim simple way to simple way to do it would just be using the uh, PCI Express interface. Right. I, I was more thinking, like, how would you like that interface to look like if you if you could get anything you wanted right here. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I, I, I haven't thought about it like that. I mean, it would be nice if there were standards behind it for a way of a, a better way, uh, an open way of exchanging um, you know, requested boot parameters uh, from the BMC and the BIOS. Uh, right now, you know, every every uh, I keep saying servers. I mean, obviously, I'm talking about servers here, but you know, you know, I mean, uh, any, any motherboards. Uh, 
uh, it's all proprietary right now. So let's let's say you um, you request a Pixie boot, for example, through the BMC. Uh, every every vendor pretty much has a different way of um, requesting that from the BIOS, and it, it would be nice if that was standardized, and if there were a lot more options that you could choose. Uh, so um, uh, that's obviously something that. Uh, people at a conference like this could get together and, and work on. But uh, I'm not aware of uh, any active efforts like that. Um, I, I know the DMTF has probably been working on things like this. Uh, you know, they, they've been putting a lot of effort into things like PLDM. Um, and uh, so they, they would probably be a, a good group, actually. If if we needed, uh, you know, somebody that's established, that's already setting standards in the BMC world, um, somebody like the DMTF would probably be good people to talk to. But uh, yeah, this is something to think about. Hi, uh, I'm <clears throat> I'm uh, very curious about the open hardware trust anchor that you alluded to, and uh, you mentioned uh, holding the mainboard in resets and intercepting. Putting something in between the sock and the spy flash uh, reminds me very much of uh, Google Titan's chips. And uh, uh, depending on how many LUTs you put on this FPGA, if you've considered using the ICE 40, which has 8K LUTs and uh, OTP memory, and yeah, please tell me more. What's okay? So that particular project is in the very early stages right now. So um, I'm, I'm hoping to have a proof of concept. Um, Maybe in well, let's say three months or so, but um, you know, the idea is to use a uh, okay. So you know, mo most most motherboards are going to come with the CPLD for glue logic, uh, power sequencing, things like that. And so, what, what if you were to instead of having a CPLD, you spend a little more money and you upgrade to a small FPGA? So uh, you know. To keep your costs down, you probably want a non-volatile FPGA, and well, it's not just for cost reasons, but also security reasons. Uh, but you, you get an inexpensive uh, non-volatile FPGA, and you can implement your logic in there, and you can provide as many SPI buses as you want. So each device, you know, this is something where I'm not, I'm not thinking of just secure boot on the CPU. I want, I want to extend that to uh, BMCs, to your network card, to any other microcontrollers, your RAID controller, and anything that might be on board, uh, you could extend it to that. Um, you don't need a ton of logic for the, the basic features because um, you can basically um, also communicate with the BMC and you can do a lot of your heavy lifting on the BMC. So if you've ensured that your BMC is, uh, is booted securely, then you can run most of your code on the BMC and just you only need a little bit of functionality in, in the FPGA. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, oh, so, um, somewhat related to the previous question, um, but in, like in general terms, I'm interested in what your threat model is. Um, one thing about bare metal hosting, I'm concerned about like, like uh, denial service attacks, SPDs on uh, on DIMMs, voltage regulators, CPLDs, um, firmware on disk drives, or the peripheral firmware, the BIOS itself. Um, you know, any system that mediates its own upgrade of configuration or firmware, um, if it's vulnerable, it's an opportunity to, to uh, install a persistent threat. So um, if, if you're living with off-the-shelf solutions right now, there are some things that might be in your th threat model that you just can't address. I, I'm interested in what is in your model and what do you hope to include uh, with advancements? Um, so obviously, um, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement uh, because, uh, you know, at the moment we're forced to just kind of accept what comes from the vendor uh, as far as the what's what's running uh, on the BMC as far as the BIOS. Um, but you know, we'd like to be able to control all of the code running uh, on on both the BMC and. Uh, during initialization of the CPU. Um, so you, you brought up a lot of uh, interesting things like, 
basically all the non bubble state in the TCP of a system. But were you suggesting somebody might um, backdoor, backdoor an SPD on a, on a DIM? And, well, you uh, can certainly uh, put configuration information in there that makes it unusable. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. So you can trash, I could rent your system and uh, trash it. And which again, of course, I hope you've got some heuristics there to say, don't rent this guy any more hardware until we figure out what's going on. Yeah, I mean, but, luckily, I mean luckily we know who, right. who is using a server at a time. And if we see that it falls off, um, well, I mean, you know, we see they, they deprovision it. And then the next person that tries to provision it, uh, it, it fails to provision, then we're going to be it's suspicious. Oh, okay. Well, that's why we're going to be very suspicious about that. Um, so, you know, I, I can't give you a full answer right now. Um, this is something I've, we have to sit down and um, do a proper analysis and look at what ex what exact threats we uh, want to protect against um, and what, you know, might be seen as uh, kind of acceptable to... Uh, Ignore for now, but uh, now obviously we need to prioritize so uh, which security features we add on as, as we go along. But uh, you know, it's going to be something where it's going to take a lot of work, and we're going to be continually improving and making things better. But uh, right now, we at least want to be able to uh, prevent customers from doing things like uh, writing their own BIOS and using that as a backdoor, and. Uh, we'll, we, we do um, we do do some uh, firmware verification during the deprovisioning process to um, to detect if somebody's tried to do that. But of course, a very sophisticated uh, actor might be able to uh, kind of hide their tracks. And uh, so, uh, without getting into too much detail, I'll say there's room for improvement, and that's why uh, I've been spending a lot of time on security lately. Um, there, yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Edwin Pierre. I work for a company called Netronome, and I see you made explicit mention of, of SmartNix. We actually released our, our open source Cornic firmware a couple of weeks ago, actually. So uh, that, that's kind of cool. But uh, in terms of where SmartNix sit in, in the infrastructure, they are kind of a, a serious threat in, in, your, in your infrastructure. I, I wonder what your thoughts are on the threat models on, with respect to SmartNix. I mean, they see every packet, um, you know, with things like TLS offload, they're starting to get access to crypto keys as well. And these things run software and, and it's not open. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Because say you're running a smart NIC, um, you might be using it to process um, you know, sensitive transactions from customers, things like that. And you, if you have a compromised, uh, if you have compromised firmware on your smart NIC, then how do you know it's not taking it and sending it back somewhere? Um, it might be looking for something very specific. Obviously, uh, you know, if, if it was a more general data harvesting type of um, situation, you, you would catch that. But what if it was a, you know, a, it was a targeted attack? They're looking for very specific data, and you don't know anything's happening until it finally gets that data and it sends it back, and now it's too late already been sent off your network. Um, so obviously, it would be great to be able to run open source firmware on a smart NIC instead of just using whatever the vendor provides. And of course, if the vendor provides uh, the source, then that, that's great. We can use that too. But uh, um, a lot of the questions have been about security. And I just wanted to mention this wasn't actually originally supposed to be um, a security-oriented talk. But uh, I knew I would have a tough crowd here today when they put me in the security track. So, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to talk about the security angles um, further with anybody that wants to talk about it. Um, my email address is here. It's scott at packet.com. Uh, you can come look for me later in the conference. Uh, also have Mike Trong over there. Uh, I'm sure he'll be glad to talk to people about this. But um, does anybody have any other questions? Uh, I know you said the project was in the early stages, but what FPGA and EDA suite are you looking at for, for doing this work? So um, there's, there's, there's two ways to answer that, obviously. One is what might we use if this was in mass production, because we have to take costs into account and uh, uh, board space and things like that. Um, so 
in that situation, uh, Intel has some nice options there as uh, an upgrade from their Max CPLDs. Um, uh, that would be at the top of the list right now if we're doing this mass production. But just as a prototype to throw something together, I've been using the Xilinx Zinc. It has a built-in ARM, ARM core uh, and uh, actually pretty powerful um, FPGA as far as lookup tables and all that goes. Um, but that is just to throw together a quick and dirty um, proof of concept. Um, and obviously, in production, you'd do something much smaller, much cheaper. So, but uh, yes, for very early stages, uh, this hardware does not exist yet, but I'm hoping it will soon. And uh, if anybody would like to have uh, updates along the way, send me an email. I'm glad to tell you uh, when, when there's more to report. And I'm sure there'll be a blog post and uh, all that. Um, yeah, please go ahead. We, we, have, uh, we are a bit running out of time, but I guess we can take two more questions and then we should be done. Uh, so I had a quick question about the uh, utility that you use to get the device tree for OpenBMC development. Uh, could you speak a little bit more about that? Is that something you guys developed? Are you guys using that right now? Yeah, so uh, I actually meant to uh, talk about that more during the talk. So. Uh, this, this is something that uh, it's a work in progress. It partially works right now. I have a little more work to do on it before being able to call it a success. But um, it, it's 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 very close to working. And uh, hopefully, I'll have a blog post. Um, I'm actually planning on doing a blog post later this month, so maybe three or four weeks from now. Uh, put out a post, put out code. But the the idea is that you take your vendors. Um, BMC firmware image that they provide. You know, you go you go to their website and you download the latest version of their BMC firmware. So you have their, their image file. It's uh, in their special format. You know, whether it's Super Micros format or an AMI image. But the idea is you you just feed that image into the tool and it spits out the device tree you would need for U-boot, uh, what you would need to provide to the Linux kernel, um, and also um, a list of sensors. Um, it, it's not going to be perfect. There are some there's some BMC firmware that does weird things. Um, maybe they add uh, I squared C muxes around the board in places you wouldn't expect it. There are some things you'll have to do manually, but it's designed to save a lot of the time. So, um, I'm glad to tell you when I have uh, code to sh share, and I think that'll be in a few weeks from now. All right, then thanks again. Thank you.